Let's go back to uh, Genesis chapter 34 once again. We were reading from this just a moment ago. Let's start with a question here. How would you like to be remembered in life? Does that sound eerie? To think in that direction? I guess um, maybe that's the mindset of a preacher, at least mine sometimes. I, I'm, I wonder. I guess because quite often I'm, I'm called on to do funerals, uh, to speak about the lives of individuals, and I often contemplate what they were like, what was the meaning of life to them. And it always causes me to stop and think, I wonder what they're going to say about me, other than he talked a lot. But how do you want to be remembered? I find it so interesting to read this last chapter of Deuteronomy. Now, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy are all penned by one individual. His name is Moses. But you get to the end of Deuteronomy, and it's talking about the death of Moses. How does <coughs> Moses talk about his death? Well, he could do that prophetically speaking and, and lay it out exactly the way it was, or maybe Joshua penned the last little part at the tail end and said, this is what happened. Either way, God inspired. We're not going to doubt that or question that or let it shake our faith in any way. But, but as you come to this last part, it's so interesting that, that you, it's like the, the package. It's got to have the bow on top. It's got to be complete. And Deuteronomy ends with the death of Moses and how that all just kind of came to fruition. And what's neat about it is that although God is not allowing him to cross over to the promised land because of basically one thing that he did in, in all that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, he gets him up on top of the mountain. He said, there he is. And he shows him all the plains of all these different areas and the mountain regions. And he said, that's where they're going. And it's almost like he said to Moses, and you're the, you're the man that's getting them to that point. Now, somebody else is going to take them because that's just the way it is, but you got them here, Moses. You did it. And so, as you read all of this, God describes some things, and kind of unique on the fact in verse 7 that Moses was 120 years old when he died, and his eyes were not dim. Or wouldn't that be nice? I wear contact lenses now. Don't know if it's any cooler than glasses that have just kind of gone that direction. Trying to look me up. Okay, we, we'll end that here. And so, uh, but I have lost some eyesight in my life. And it gets kind of rough in the mornings when I wake up and look around and everything's blurry until at least I find some glasses. And I don't look forward to getting worse. Here's a guy that's 120 years old and his eyes are sharp. So cool. God's doing that all along the way. And then in addition to that, he says his natural vigor has not diminished. Okay, older guys. Doesn't it wear down a little bit faster than it used to? And you hear about these kids that are pulling up. I stayed up all night and studied for a test and I got up three hours later. And, you know, and they do this. And uh, I start wearing down sooner than I used to. 120. Now those are little details about Moses. But here's what God says. You know, the epitaph. Written, if you want to say, on some rock buried out there in an unknown grave. Because nobody knows, it says here, where he actually was buried. It says, verse 5, Moses, the servant of the Lord. Of all the things that he's done. And what accomplishment. I mean, he marked back into Egypt, stand in front of Pharaoh, who everybody thought was almighty Pharaoh. He was God himself. 
He commanded everything of the most powerful nation that existed in that time. And he looked him in the eye and said, you're going to let God's people go. I am in charge of you, at least at this point. And in a period of time, because of God's power working through him, the plagues and all that, Pharaoh gave in. Never before had that happened. And you describe all the amazing things that he did and all the things that, that, that just are wrapped up in that. And you get to the end and, it, and God says, this is what it's all about right here. Serving the Lord. Now how much more we really do you want to ask God to say about you? I find that really interesting. I find it unique. I find it really special. Because that capsule, that accomplishment... I can't go before Pharaoh. I certainly can't throw a, a rod down the ground and cause it to turn into a snake or, or get people to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. I barely can get into a family fellowship, you know, balloon feed everybody truckloads of food every day for 40 years. And, and But I can be a servant. Hey, we all can be servants. And that's what I, I, when I'm looking at this, this is God says, this is, the, this is the basis of it all. I'm going to put you on earth, and I'm going to give you the tools that you need to have for the things that I'm going to ask you to do, as God did for Moses. Matter of fact, when you go back at, at his calling at the beginning, in the early part of the book of Exodus, when God says, Moses, we need somebody down in Egypt to tell Pharaoh he needs to let people go. Moses says, yeah, right, that's, that's great. And the guy said, you're the one. And Moses said, wait a minute. Now, I'm paraphrasing greatly here. But he had all of those excuses of why he couldn't go. And God said, I, I've got you covered. I've got your spokesman. I, I made your tongue. I've got your staff for you. We're going to do some things together, you and I. My power, you're following. Just be my servant. And that's all he did, step by step, wandering through the wilderness, wherever he went, God served. And when he gets to the end of his life, God said, you're my servant. Now I can do that. So if I fail at anything, it's one of two things. Either I took on a task I shouldn't have done, or I didn't really pay attention to what God was asking me to do. Because he'll equip me for everything out there that he wants me to do. He just says, go be my servant. I find that really special. Because I'm looking in the eyes of everybody here, and there's not a person here among you that's probably not telling themselves or at least thinking about it. I can be a servant at something. And I can't do all of these things, and I can't do some things like some people can. But I can serve. In some way, some capacity, I can have a very important part in what's going on in my duties that God asked me to do. Now, as you read on through here toward the end, this is what happens. At least it did for Moses. We didn't read all the, the last part, but I intentionally left part of it out. It talks about Moses being 120 years old and his eyes went dim or his natural vigor diminished. And then verse 8 said, And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab for 30 days. I wonder what they said about and the stories that they told. And the reminders to their kids, of, you know, don't forget about this guy here. Be like Moses. And all the things they might have said. And as it goes on, it talks about Joshua being given the reins in verse 9. And then it says in verse 10, But since then, there's not arisen in Israel a prophet like Moses, whom the Lord knew Face to face. I remember first reading that passage, and it was years ago now. And, and it, it, the first time I'd read it, you know, I didn't grow up reading the Bible like some of you did. Others right there with me that you're reading the Bible maybe for the first time in your life because you, you're just latching on to it. But that section, boy, just like, he did what? Talk to God face to face. And I thought, Well, here's what I'm seeing between what Moses did and the connection of what God calls him. That being a servant 
brings you close to God. And the better you serve, the closer you get. Now, I'm not talking about how industrious you are. That you jam-pack your schedule every second of the day. And you just over-exhaust yourself. Because I don't think God calls us to do that. But He does call us to work and to be faithful at it. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, as, as Paul is talking about that, and he uses the term steward, he says, moreover, it's required of a steward that he found faithful. Now, there's a lot of words we use today to describe how people do. Oh, you're doing super excellent, you know, and I use a lot of those. But just faithful. Right, I'm here. I'm on the job doing it. I'm, I'm pursuing it the best I can. I'm faithful. And that's what Moses is. And, and his faithfulness as a servant brought him closer and closer to God. Then when he got through, they were good friends. Or you could look at it the other way, and I'm seeing a kind of a combination. That maybe the closer that he got to God, the more he was a better servant. But I see one just feeding on the other. Kind of like uh, doing arm wrestling with uh, Harrison sometimes. He just come along. You know, he pops me sometimes. I, I love wrestling, but the fact is he's getting a lot bigger than I am now. But I'm talking about Craig's teenage son here. He'll come up and just nudge me and start to walk away. And I'll, I'll might pop him one back, and he's got to come around and catch me back again. And each one gets a little bit harder or a little bit more. And uh, that's cool. For me, it is anyway. I know I'm an old man, but somebody's paying attention to me, and I like it. And I like the way he goes about it, and come up and salute me, and I don't need to. But there's a relationship, and each one's back and forth. And here's servant, getting close to God. Close to God, better serve, better serve, closer to God. Back and forth. So think about it. Because again, back to this, this basic premise, hey, I can serve Ooh. If that's it, then it means, hey, I can get close to God. It's no longer the preacher that can do it, or the elders, or a few widows or widowers in the congregation in their late 80s that have finally got that halo really polished. But it's just any one of us just getting it together brings it close to God. Whatever talents you have, that you think, well, it's not that big of a deal. Just give it to God. Serve in the way that he says. And it makes a difference. Does to God, God gets closer. And, and so in this whole process, I see that. Now, let's jump over to the New Testament for just a moment and look at the book of Matthew here. Because this is, for the most part, the very thing that Jesus has spent Spend three, spending three years doing with his apostles. Getting, getting them to grasp that concept of, I've not called you to order co commands to people. You're, you're the twelve apostles. And, and uh, I'm sure, just from what we see in the Gospels, and, and they're debating back and forth oftentimes of who the greatest is, that they had a good vision about, you know, some of these guys are going to have better positions than others because... He needs me to be in charge. Guys like being in charge. At least some of them did. Man. So, Matthew 20. And moms sometimes like their kids to be the ones that really excel, don't you? This is the 2020 vision of a woman. Exodus, or rather, Matthew 20, verse 20. That's why I call it 2020. Help you remember the future. Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him. That capital H means he came to Jesus. With her sons. Now, Mom, these guys are full grown men. But she's going to do this for them. Come on, boys, we're going to go down here. Yes, ma'am. No matter how old you get. So she's marching the two of them up there to Jesus. kneeling down and asking something of him. 
So here's the woman with her sons. And Jesus looks at her and says, what do you want? What are you wishing for? He knows. What do you wish? He said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and the other on the left in your kingdom. Now, she's not talking about heaven. She's got a vision just like the, probably the apostles do, that there's going to come a day that these 12 guys are going to be ruling all of Jerusalem, all of Rome. The Roman Empire is going to be tossed out, and these guys are going to be in charge. And I want my two right there at the top. Just whichever one you pick, Jesus, just put my sons up there, right hand, left hand, and the rest of them just kind of fall in line. We're going to have two best men here, following behind the man in charge. And they'll direct the other guys, who probably aren't as good of apostles anyways, what mom's thinking. And, and no, they didn't intentionally leave out her name, like she didn't want people to know. That's just a phraseology sometimes in the Greek. So it's the mother of them and the son. But she's asking questions. Jesus comes back in verse 22 and answers and says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are. And they did. One of those guys was the first martyr among the apostles. You look in the book of Acts and he got his head cut off by hairs and John, the other one, ended up being known as the Apostle of Love. A little switch from the Sons of Thunder reputation that they had in the earlier part of their life. And as far as we know through history, they lived out where he was the only Apostle that wasn't killed, dying a natural death. Well, as we go on here, so he's asking the question, making the comment, are you able to do that? But he says, uh, to sit on my right hand or on my left is not mine to give, but it's for those for whom it's prepared by my Father. Now with the ten, that's the rest of the guys, as they're coming up, because they're figuring out what's happening. And it's taking a little time, and they're all standing around watching, and all of a sudden Zebedee's uh, wife shows up. They know John James' mom, and, and it's like, what's she doing here? And all of a sudden she's on her knees, and they're starting to come up here figuring out what's going on. Okay, when they heard this, it says they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Trying to get one up on me. They debated this back and forth on who was the greatest. But Jesus called them to himself. Okay, guys, come over here. Let's do this again. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. You guys, apostles, you, you're, there's what you're thinking. That you're going to sit in a chair, one on one side, one on the other side, and you're going to start calling out commands and lording it over everybody. That's what everybody else does. Now you think, when we come in, we're going to follow that? Verse 26, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The lesson Jesus is giving to the apostles now it's just all the way back down to this basic. Uh, forget about calling out commands and directing and organizing and, and being the, the most important person everybody looks up to. It's back down to the basics. I just want you, you know, like I talked about Moses back here. Be a servant. Put Jesus in. Be a servant. You 12 guys here, you've got to get it together. I want my church to look to you for examples. You're to be a servant. Which means, that's what we're about. Such a neat thing here. Okay. So, uh, moms and kids, if we think about what we aspire to, 
to be and what we want our kids to grow up and be, you know. It's so so neat when your you know parents and grandparents pull out pictures of their kids and here's their graduation. They're gonna go to law school, they're gonna go be a doctor, you know, they're so proud and and now I've never had anybody come up and say, My child's gonna grow up to be a servant someday. We just don't think like that. Do we? But that's exactly what Jesus is trying to get us to understand. The best thing we can teach each other, the best instruction we can give to these little ones around here, is learn to serve. That's a hard thing to think about. Because you want them to be the doctors or the lawyers or the engineers or the, you know, somebody big up there, important, work in Washington, D.C., change the world. What Jesus did. Being a servant. A servant of the Lord. What it does, it gets you closer to God. And the result of that is you become a better servant. Or more like what Jesus says, Jesus himself. Some thoughts for the evening. I know we have a Super Bowl coming up, and you may or may not be going over to share some of that activity, but as you, you just go through your motions of tonight, tomorrow, this week, along with some things that I suggested this morning. Now, what we're about is being servants. And we can do that effectively. Each one. With the abilities God's given us in a very unique way. And it can make major impact in the lives of people. When we do it right. Besides drawing us closer to God. If you like it, if you like it, you need prayers. Just whatever you need. You sing a song, an opportunity, something's new to come to that life. While we sing, one come.